But the email said something like, it's a shame, but the cardiovascular effect is there. But the drug will do well, and we will do well. Oh, God. That's written down. It's written and down. And no one goes to jail for that. No, he's... I mean, that, that is insane. I mean, imagine any other thing that you do that's fraud that causes 40,000 deaths? Is that what you Between 40 and 60. Imagine any other thing. Any other thing that you would sell. Imagine if that was like Oreo cookies or, you know, whatever. It's unheard of. It's unheard of, and that's why it continues. Um, right. When we look at the FDA and ask the same question, you can see that 61% of the FDA's budget for human products is paid for by the drug companies. That seems like a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> and it might seem like it might have some effect. Yeah, maybe. It, yeah, just maybe. maybe. A little bit. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. That's um, horrible. So that's not hard to connect those yeah. dots. Um, drugs for COVID are going to be affected, effective, I hope. But why should a company be allowed to charge a government $25 for a vaccine? when it cost them about $3 to make, and much of the technology was done by the NIH anyway. Why should we allow that to go on? Why should Pfizer be selling $65 billion worth of vaccine when their profit margin, uh, one of the stock analysts said their profit margin after the first year or two is gonna be 60 or 80%. So why, why is that? Like what kind of deals have been made? Because, the, because they, they spend so much in lobbying and so much in political contributions and they're nonpartisan in their political, bipartisan in their political contributions. The Democrats get paid and the Republicans get paid. And we're in this charade. We almost had an opportunity to have some effect controlling drug prices. And we came up this, with this plan to limit um, the price of insulin, the copay for insulin for $35 when you're using the wrong insulin. Just get some experts together and decide which insulin you should use. And this is obviously just one drug. I'm sure there's probably countless other yeah. versions of this. Yeah, this is story. a particular. What's really happening is that there's a nexus of influence. I, I, I don't want to use the word conspiracy, but the drug companies are <clears throat> working with the journals and selling them back reprints or buying back reprints of the articles. And the journals, part of the deal is not to ask for the data. And the academic medical centers are working with the drug companies and giving them more control than you would think academics would give to private industry because they're making money. The, the institutions are making money and the researchers are making money. <clears throat> and the physician societies, the professional organizations are getting paid by drug companies. They're taking drug company money. They, they in large part, oversee the guidelines that are, pay, that are made. Um, so that we've got this nexus of confluent interest that's feeding at the trough of drug company money. And that's called market failure. And market failure doesn't correct itself. You need government. You need to break this up. It's like a trust buster. It's like you know, breaking up uh, Microsoft or saying, you know, uh, you, my, the market failure is so comprehensive that it's got every, all the parties impression of how medicine should be run in the United States going in their direction. And we need an umpire. <clears throat> Evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. Most of them are trying to be good docs. And they're just naive to the influence that the drug companies have on these journals, like you were perhaps in the 80s? Yes, that's exactly right. Mm. That's scary because that means that they think that they're acting in good faith and that they're doing a good job and they're, they're using evidence-based medicine and, in fact, they're getting manipulated. That's exactly right. That's terrifying. It's terrifying. And that is because of the journals. The journals are playing a role. The professional societies are playing a role. In... The pharmaceutical drug companies are clearly yeah. playing a role. Yeah. So that should be, in your opinion, well, in my opinion, that should be illegal. You, do you agree with that? That be should exact. be regulated. What's in the in that? terms of like, the, well, the that being the hiding of the data and the, the, the showing their assessment of the data to peer review. Yes. That seems crazy. It seems crazy. 
And there's an organization <clears throat> called, number two is that <clears throat> a survey was done of Americans who heard about the Agile Helm issue, and 60% of Americans believed that it worked. Even though there was no evidence that it worked, this it, is really this is, scary. What is this based on? What is their sixty percent based on? What, where did they get the information from? Um, it was probably press releases from the company um, about reducing amyloid plaques, and maybe some news reports. Uh, yeah, it came through the media and the press releases. So they were reported on, like you know, MSNBC or what have you. I can't say that for a fact. But. Some some <coughs> networks, some some yeah. sort of media. Yeah, NPR covered it. Oh, okay. actually, the, and NPR covered it in a favorable light. Well, they reported a true fact, which is that it reduces amyloid, but, but they, didn't, they say... didn't pick up that there are 27 studies that have been done that the FDA wrote a memo about that of drugs that reduced amyloid, and none of them improved Alzheimer's. And they also didn't talk about the was it 33 percent of the adverse side effects? Right. That's a lot. Yeah, it's actually 41 percent, but you correct it down to 33 because. Uh, eight percent in the control group had side effects. So oh I'm God. trying to be fair here. That's so nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> you're preventing more hospitalizations than you're causing uh, myocarditis. Um, and the the myocarditis in the kids tends to be um, not disastrous. Well, how do we know that? Uh, that's from the Israeli data. They had 129 people. And one, right, but we don't have long-term studies on that. We don't. No, that's fair. That's but absolutely that's fair. that's where myocarditis is the issue, right? Like, I was reading this thing about myocarditis, about when people develop the type of myocarditis that they've had from vaccine injuries, a significant swelling of the heart tissue, like, that over time, like, this, is a, this could be a significant issue in their life. The answer is we don't know. Right. We can't know. Time has not gone by. And the, I, the reason why I made that slide is to say, A, you are raising the issue is really important, and it ain't over. It should be considered. So if you ask me, which I was hoping you wouldn't, um, <laughs> if you ask me, <laughs> do I think kids should get vaccinated, um, I think my response would be that at this point in time, it looks like in the future we're going to say that it was better to get vaccinated than not. Even for children? Uh, for, uh, to 12, to age 12. But here's the thing about these children, when you're saying deaths and uh, hospitalizations, and, but, but deaths in particular, they're all with comorbidities. And many of these comorbidities are lifestyle re related, right? Many of these comorbidities are, are kids that are grossly obese yes. or that have all sorts of health yeah. problems that are associated with that 80% that you talked about, the way they live their lives yes. and the yes. food they take in. Yes. That seems like an easier prevention, and then you avoid the possible, even though it's a small number, if you're dealing with healthy children, that's what's so scary. Because if you're dealing with healthy children that seem to be getting myocarditis, a lot of them, I was watching this video on TikTok that was removed for whatever reason, because it had millions and millions of views, but it was a 14-year-old boy that was in the hospital who was talking about his case of myocarditis and they, they deleted the video. It was a personal account yeah. of a kid yeah. who got vaccinated. Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing is, if it's affecting healthy people that aren't at risk from COVID, like the number of kids that are at risk from dying of COVID is fairly small, right? Correct, 800 kids have died. And those kids, the vast majority of them have comorbidities. I haven't seen that data, but I believe it's I true. believe that's the data that I saw, was that yeah. they, they yeah. can't account for, I don't know what the number is, but very, very few kids have died that didn't have something significantly wrong yep. with them. Yep. Now, so 